Justin Taylor. Welcome to the show, brother. Appreciate you having me. Tell us how you got 2.4 million Hilton points. <laughs> yeah, this is one that uh, I don't know that it's necessarily repeatable, but it's one of those things where you always got to be on the lookout for a way to turn some kind of bad thing into an opportunity or just look for whether it's loopholes or whatever it is to really maximize things. And so I was living in Boston. Um, and if you've ever lived a place like that, a lot of the apartments are each level is its own apartment. It's kind of like an old multifamily home. The third floor caught on fire and I was the only one in the place that actually had renter's insurance. And when I was looking at where they could put me up, you know, it could be an Airbnb, it could be a hotel, it could be a, you know, a, a lease somewhere. So I picked a hotel and I picked a hotel that had free breakfast and uh, the social happy hour in the afternoon. So I had like all my meals already taken care of, even though they're giving me a stipend. And they said, Hey, you know, we can cover that for you. That way you don't have to worry about it. And I said, no, I'd rather like I pay for it and you reimburse me. So I go out and I get the nicest tilt and credit card. They had some multipliers going on at the time, signed up for those. And I lived in the hotel for five months and ended up with 2.4 million Hilton points. I've been, um, you know, to Hawaii. I've been to um, Cabo. I'm going to Vegas this weekend on the points. So still to this day, and that was in 2017, I believe. Um, I'm still using those points and I still have like a little over 700,000 um, as it stands today. Wow. That's super strategic and smart. Um, you were consciously doing that right it wasn't by happenstance you're like hey i want to i want to manufacture all this spending on this card so that i can accumulate these points knowing that they're going to reimburse me correct 100 percent. like i didn't even have a hilton credit card until i was faced with a situation i was like oh this is the perfect opportunity to get the hilton credit card and like stack this stuff and you know get all the multipliers get the 10 times points for being a diamond and then they had some one-off multipliers at the time for like double points so i'm getting like 20 times points on a you know probably a 250 dollars night hotel for five months. that's really incredible it's pretty amazing with intention how much additional money you can create in your life and when i was reviewing your blog in preparation for this uh website you mentioned that uh this idea that money is everywhere and this is a, a perfect example of how you literally just created a bunch of extra quote unquote money for yourself. It wasn't necessarily in the form of cold, hard cash, but it was in the form of points that you've been using for essentially the last three years uh, or excuse me, six years to uh, fund uh, a really rich lifestyle. So loved, love that example. All right. Before we dive too deep, let's actually introduce you to the audience. So Justin Taylor is the co-host of the Financial Independence Show, as well as the creator of Savings, uh, Saving Sherpa. And I've become aware of your existence through uh, your co-host and our mutual friend, uh, Cody Berman. And I really wanted to have you on the show because I think you're an incredible example of someone who has used the W2 nine to five to like rocket your way to financial independence at a fairly young age, living a really rich lifestyle. Like you didn't necessarily sacrifice, you know, all areas in life. You were just very intentional about how you spent your money, how you accumulated your money and the various strategies that you put into place, including like what you did with that uh, apartment fire. So, um, let's bring it back. Let's dive into your childhood. What was money like for you growing up? Yeah, I mean, money was, was pretty tight growing up. And, you know, I guess I think about it through a little bit of a different lens. Like it didn't feel so tight to me because of kind of like where my parents came from, like where my mom came from, you know, she was I always say she's kind of like third world country poor, even though she's not that old, like she was born in 66. Um, but you know, she had my brother when she was 15. Um, her dad was an alcoholic. Her mom had some, you know, mental health issues. And so she was getting clothes at the dump, you know, for school. Um, she was as poor as like, again, I always think about it as like a third world country kind of setup, even though this is 
1980. Um, you know, she had to lie about her age so that she could get into a factory job. She couldn't, you know, wasn't even old enough to drive a car. So she's pulling my brother around in a wagon. Um, like I can't even imagine that kind of lifestyle. So we, money was very tight for us as well, but I can't even like imagine where she came from. And so, but for us, you know, my mom was a single mom. Um, she worked at a furniture factory, ended up leaving that job and, uh, going back to cosmetology school because it was like that furniture factory job was just running to the grant, running her into the ground. And I don't, I don't blame her for that at, at all, but that meant we had a period of time with, with no money coming in and we already didn't really have any money. So I remember, um, I had an uncle who worked at a grocery store and he would get us the big five pound tubes of ground beef that when they went out of date, he would freeze them and get them to us. And it was just that noodles, you know, it was just ground beef and noodles for the most part. Um, but my mom really prioritized me like getting to go into life without that in impacting me as much as possible. And, you know, with that, I mean, although we didn't have a lot of money, we did try to like make sure I had some, you know, decent clothes for school. Like we did kind of prioritize some of those outward facing things so that, um, you know, I didn't get like put in a box as far as everyone else seeing how tight the money was. And so I really respect that as well, even though you could say logically, that's not where you should spend your money. Um, it, it meant me being able to live a more normal lifestyle growing up. Yeah. I, this is where I feel a uh, kinship with you is money was like super tight for me growing up as well, but both through my own work and, you know, bless my mom, uh, who raised me as a, a single parent for most of my childhood. Like I invested my money and my family's money into having clothes that looked nice enough that it, like w money wasn't that much of a challenge, even though at the home, it was a total challenge. It was one of the biggest challenges of my childhood. So I, I really resonate with you there. So Tell us about, you know, as you, you know, money's super tough. And then in high school, I know you run into some additional challenges. And I'm just going to read from your blog because I found this particular passage really, um, really meaningful to your story arc and kind of surprising and sad, but great in the way that it ultimately turned out. So you wrote, my parents didn't have any money from my college, so I went to my guidance counselor. I asked him what I would need to do if I desired to go straight to a four-year university instead of the community college down the road. He replied, if you want to put your parents in debt for the rest of their lives, I won't be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me um, because it really like lit a fire under me. I am the type of person and, you know, someone could argue whether or not it's it's healthy or not. But uh, I turn things like that into fuel. Like I get angry and I get pissed off and I like to prove people wrong anytime that I get put in those situations. So um, him telling me that, you know, basically it was impossible or he's not going to help me was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, it was true. Like my parents didn't have any money for me to go to school on. Um, I just knew that, you know, I grew up in North Mississippi also. I know we haven't really talked about that, but it's a very rural part of Mississippi. And I just had this like deep down feeling like this is not like where I'm supposed to spend all of my life. Like there's more out there. And so even though the four year university I was looking at was only two hours down the road, it wasn't the 15 minute down the road community college that everyone went to. Um, literally everyone went there. And so I was just like, I just need to get out of this bubble so that I've got, you know, more opportunity, just get me out of this rut kind of thing. Um, but once he told me that I was like, okay, well, I got to figure this out and keep in mind, most of the people on the, my mom's side of the family, almost no one has a high school diploma, much less college. Like no one in my family had went to college. So I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew that like the ACT uh, could unlock some scholarships. And so I proceeded to take the ACT seven times until I got the scholar, <laughs> till I got to a point where it unlocked that next level of scholarships and made it to where now all of a sudden 
it's it's a re- reasonable thing to consider. Like I actually, it is going to be possible for me to go to college. Not everything's paid for at that point, but now it's starting to seem real. Um, once I got that, I ended up getting, you know, I, forget, I think like a 29 on my ACT and that unlocked that next level of scholarships from Mississippi. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's a really powerful story. Instead of letting that moment essentially limit your entire life, you utilize it as fuel to really unleash and unlock your best self at that point in your life. And I I think that's, it's pretty amazing that you did that because, um, I mean, I, I, when I read that, I was just like, I can't believe a guidance counselor would say that. Like what, you know, in my mind, when I was reading, that, I was like, what kind of guidance counselor like discourages uh, the students within their high school to pursue higher education? Yeah, I mean, it was just such a non-typical thing to do. Like no one was going to a four year university and um, and anyone and the school that I went to, no one had money. I mean, it was kind of the you know, there's three county schools in the one city school and it is by far the poorest county school i graduate with 34 people you oh, know wow. it's <laughs> so it's it's um there wasn't a lot of like kind of footsteps to walk into and me and uh my best friend still this day uh you know i think we kind of blazed a little bit of a path that and it, i think you started to see more kids start to realize it was possible after the fact um because it is such a small community you know, this is K through 12, all in the same grounds. I know some people listen to this, that might sound wild to them, but it's, you know, like I said, it's tiny graduate with 34 people. So, you know, you know, everyone, you know, their grandparents, you know, their parents, you know, their siblings, you know, all the teachers, like it's not this, like, you know, to me, when I see some of these high schools here in Austin, Texas, where I live now, it almost feels like a university where everyone is kind of in their own little world and they're not really super connected. It's a very tight knit thing. So when you do something like that and you show that it's possible, it does actually make real difference. Like people see that and start to, you know, kind of open up their limiting beliefs a little bit. Yeah. So it sounds like you were one of the few people you know, within your high school to pursue uh, a four-year university degree. So like, in a sense, like you were kind of like an outlier. And I'm just curious, like, what, what was it within you that, that made you want to, you know, go and leave this kind of like safe, comfortable environment that you grew up in? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting question that I've, I've thought a lot about, and um, I don't know exactly. I mean, I was always really naturally good at math. I was always uh, really drawn towards technology, um, and I was always like very conscious of money, even at a, an oddly early age. Like, I remember a story one time where um, I'm riding with my uncle down, you know, going towards the coast to visit my aunt. He sends me in the uh, gas station to get a a 12 pack of cokes and now keep in mind a lot of my family on my dad's side at one point or another had worked for coca-cola um they had they had like a little regional kind of distribution center there in in corinth and uh so he sends me in there to get a 12 pack of cokes and he's like what is he doing like he's been in there for 20 minutes and i'm i don't know maybe 10 years old and I'm in there calculating what the price per ounce is on the different types of soda. And I come out with some random off brand 12 pack of, you know, soda. And he's like, what is this? Like I ask you for Cokes and I start explaining to him though, about like how much cheaper this is per ounce and all this sort of thing. He's like, I don't care. That's not what I, that's not what I wanted. Um, so there's been these little things just ingrained in me. And I think a lot of it comes from my grandfather as far as that kind of the financial part and the math part. He was a farmer, but he kept like really detailed notes on everything that he, he spent money on, on like, uh, you know, how much his crops harv, you know, how big his harvest was, like what it produced, how much he sold, how much he spent to, on seeds, all that stuff. He kept super detailed notes. And I think that rubbed off on me. Um, but as far as the kind of getting out of town type thing, I, I really don't know where exactly it came from because you know, all my family's still there. My parents are still there. Um, 
not many people left, but I just knew, I, I just knew even like when I was in high school that I needed a different kind of a more successful, a more challenging kind of environment. And, um, I just knew that wasn't it. I didn't know exactly where was it, but I knew that wasn't it. Yeah. It's interesting because this is another very like similar circumstance in my own life. So I, I had about 140 people in my graduating high school class. So definitely not as small as where you grew up, but it was definitely a small town. It was actually, I believe it's like one of the top retirement towns um, in Washington state. So there is like an incredible amount of old people. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> I got to get out of here. And as you were talking, I was reflecting back on my own kind of like, why did I have such a deep desire to get out of that town and to like go somewhere else? And, you know, one of my earliest influences was Tony Robbins, because I read the book Unleash the Power Within. And, you know, within kind of Tony Robbins, um, you know, philosophy, he really, you know, talks about getting around the, the, like the type of people that you want to be like. And I think that, uh, subconsciously made me be like, well, I don't want to be like the people I, that I'm surrounded with here where I'm growing up. Like I want, uh, to chase a bigger life. And so I think that caused me to kind of have this like dream of like going to California and, and going to a great college, um, and just like surrounding myself, um, with people that would really empower me to, uh, live a different life than what, you know, many of the people I grew up with would go on to live. So, um, I'm just realizing that now at age 41, <laughs> cause I've been wondering the same thing. That's why I asked you the question as I was just like, what, what made you and I be like, I, I like, I have to get out of this town. Cause that was me growing up. I was like, I have to get out of this town. Um, so, um, all right, well take us to college. Like how did you end up uh, you know, paying for university, obviously, uh, it's not cheap to go to any or your university, uh, share with us how you, uh, figured that one out. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of similar to the, you know, when I think about like that, the Hilton story with the, the credit card points, like now that when you start to look at this problem of like, okay, how do I go to college? And you start to realize, okay, well, there's these scholarships, then it starts to turn from how do I get college paid for to how do I make money going to college? And so, um, you know, I'm looking at trying to get every scholarship possible. Well, one of my friends, um, comes to me and tells me that they're going to go do interviews for ROTC. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And they're like, it's for the air force. Um, you know, there's some scholarships that they give out. They don't give them out to everyone, but about 10% of people who go, um, to a four year college in RTC, get a high school scholarship for the air force. And so I start, you know, digging into it and I realized that you can actually go for the first year, take their money and you don't owe them anything. Um, if you start that second year in the program, now all of a sudden you're committed, but you could take their year for, you could take their money for a year, no strings attached. So I thought, well, that's what I'll do. That's what I'll try to do at least. And really my biggest motivator for going to do this interview and I know it's in that article I sent you, but, um, it's very true is, you know, we didn't really ever go out to eat much and I knew that, or, or travel anywhere. And I knew to do this interview, I needed to go to Oxford, um, which was like an hour and a half away. And I knew with that, like we'd be going out to eat somewhere. And so honestly, the enticing offer of getting to eat at like an Applebee's is probably what was one of the biggest turning points in my life. Um, so I go, I go do this interview at the time I'm in terrible shape. I was, a uh, I was an offensive lineman in high school, but I was not like a strong offensive lineman. I was just a chubby kid. Um, I completely lied about my physical fitness test that you were supposed to take before you go do this interview. Um, I guess as a side note, if you don't know what ROTC is, it is, uh, like it's the training that you would go through to become an officer in the military um, programming that you take while you're in college, uh, that is akin to going to a, an academy like the air force academy, but it's a way to go to a public college and, and enter the air force. Um, but we were supposed to take this physical fitness test beforehand and even get it notarized. 
Well, thankfully for me, my offensive lineman coach in high school was a notary of the public. <laughs> so I just make up some numbers and he just signs it. He doesn't care. Um, and, you know, it's I it's I couldn't I didn't even know what to put. Like, I didn't even know what was good because I was in such bad shape. And so when I look back at it, it's laughable, like the numbers that I put on there for like how many push ups I did. It wasn't even like it wasn't even good, but it was still way more than I could do. Um, and like you had to put down a mile of time for your run and all that sort of stuff. So I completely falsified that because I was in terrible shape, had long hair, probably did not look like somebody who'd be joining, but I do the interview. I do really well in the interview and they see that I'm going to be a computer engineer as my major. And so that's enticing enough to them, even though I didn't really have the physical components and they decided to give me the scholarship. Um, at the time I didn't even really think it was a big deal. Cause I, at the time I thought everybody got them. And then I realized that, you know, only 10% of people get this scholarship. But again, my plan is just to take their money for a year. Um, but I started college in 2008. And so I started seeing, I mean, during my first year, I started seeing the great recession happen. I start to see people who have masters in engineering, not being able to get jobs. And I start to think, you know what, like, maybe this isn't such a bad idea to do this air force thing, um, and get some real life experience. And that way I can get a better job afterwards. Um, but with that, with those scholarships, um, you know, other scholarships I applied for and the air force paying for my tuition, plus uh, the college I went to, which was Mississippi state, they threw in room and board for free for anyone who was one of those high school scholarship recipients of, uh, from the RTC is like a way to entice people to come to Mississippi state. Um, I, I would go every semester to the finance office and they'd cut me a check. Um, you know, I bought a car while I was in college and a motorcycle. I didn't have a normal job other than RTC. And I still was, you know, pocketing probably an extra, five grand a semester, even after doing all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it turned out to be a pretty good thing. Um, we going from having no idea how I was going to pay for college, not getting a penny from my parents to profiting off of it and coming out with a free and clear car, motorcycle and all that sort of stuff and no college debt. That's pretty amazing question for you. So I don't know a lot about ROTC. What were like the weekly monthly quarterly requirements was there you know like you mentioned you didn't have a job but where did you have to invest you know time hours into the rotc program that you know maybe not as much as hours as a job but did require you know time away from studying or partying or enjoying your college years <laughs> yeah you had um you know, you had physical training in the mornings, three days a week, I think it was either two or three days a, a week, uh, kind of first thing early in the morning, like six o'clock. Um, you had a class that you would have to take every semester. Um, and then you had a lab every semester. So you're talking basically like those two hours of more classroomy type stuff between the hour class and the, um, hour lab. Um, but if you think about it, I guess in college, right, you got the class like say it's three days a week. Um, and then you got that lab and then the PT. So it's maybe like six hours a week. Um, during most of the time, uh, you have this one, the summer between your soft, let's see, the summer between your sophomore and junior year, you do, um, four weeks, which is kind of your equivalent to boot camp. So that's four weeks straight. Um, and then your um, sophomore year, because you're getting ready for that boot camp thing, that second semester, there's a lot of extra time you're using to kind of prep for some of these things that, um, because instead of going to the normal, like physical training with everybody else at Mississippi State at the time, we had one of the most um, kind of aggressive um, uh, field training prep uh, curriculums, I think, in the country. I think there's realistically they're probably doing some things they weren't, you know, legally allowed to do. Um, but it meant when we got to field training, it was a breeze cause they had already tortured us for six, uh, you know, for a semester. So that one semester was pretty tough. The rest of the time it was kind of probably about a six hour commitment. So it really wasn't bad. And that as a high school scholarship recipient, you know, you get tuition paid for, you get a stipend, you get, um, money for books. Um, and then, like I said, Mississippi state threw in the, uh, the, the housing for free as well. I love that. 
All right. So 2008, you start college. I assume it's four years total that you're there. And then after college, is there a requirement for you to like be in the Air Force for a certain amount of time um, before you are released to go pursue, you know, a non-military career or how does that work? Yeah. So because I was doing a computer engineering degree, um, almost no classes would count as an elective um, that weren't other, other forms of engineering. So whereas some kids got credit for those Air Force classes towards their degree, I didn't. So I ended up uh, taking five years and the Air Force said because it was a technical degree, they'd pay for five years. So I thought, why not? Why stress and try to rack it on? Because I graduated with like 150 something hours, um, whereas normally it's more like 120 is what you graduate with. So I did five years. Um, so it was it been 2013 when I graduated. And it actually got me into a weird position because during that time, uh, in 2013, they were doing what's called a reduction in force. So the Air Force was getting rid of a lot of people um, because what happens is they over-recruit and they under-recruit. And so it, it goes from they need to get rid of people to now they're trying to you know, scramble and get more people. And they're always trying to get the right number of people and it's a moving target. So with that, you know, I had graduated college, but they didn't have a job waiting for me. Um, it's supposed to be a four year commitment. And I had really all my eggs in this one basket. I had not been interviewing with other companies. I had not done any internships. I just thought, yeah, I'm going to be an air force officer. Um, and so for seven months, uh, I was kind of just sitting on my hands waiting, wondering if I'm going to have a job. And finally, um, I got a call one day, um, from our, from my tech sergeant and she was like, all right, you know, like you're going to, you're going to Colorado. Um, you'll start in December. So December, 2013 is when I truly like entered the air force and started my first career. Um, and so it's a four year commitment. Um, and, and so that's the thing, you know, some people, they graduate college earlier, they start their jobs earlier. They make more money earlier. Um, but I was basically 24 before I started earning any income and I was making 40 something thousand dollars a year, um, to get started. So I think that's another thing about my story and I know we'll, we'll unpack all of it, but it's to me, extremely repeatable, if not easy to, to out or easy to outdo what I did because I mean, I didn't really start earning money until I was 24 and I was making 40 something thousand dollars a year. That's not a real high bar, um, for somebody who, you know, became financially independent at 30 and a, a millionaire by 31, like, um, and, and never having any kind of crazy side hustle or inheritance or, you know, entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. Um, let's dig into that a little bit more. So, you're in uh, the Air Force for four years. Is, I, and excuse me for asking, um, like with what happened um, with how you did ROTC and then you have four years in the Air Force, is there risk of like being deployed or how does that work? Because I was one of those people, I actually considered the Air Force because of the same reason, the scholarship, but ultimately decided against it because like I've never been a fan of war uh and definitely yeah. did not want to like ever be deployed so help me understand how that works um because i i also read you know in in your web on your website that you were a little concerned about being deployed too but uh you kind of left left us with a, a cliffhanger whether or not that was ever a true risk or if you were ever deployed yeah. I mean, and I guess like taking a step back, I was in a similar position as you where like, I didn't, that's not what I wanted in life. Like I never had any thought about ever joining the military growing up. Like to me, in my mind, what the military was, was kicking down doors overseas, making minimum wage. Like I thought that's how I had, that's the box I had put it in. Um, but then you start to learn more and more about it and you start to realize, oh, there's like a very kind of corporate side. There's a very technical side to the, to the military as well. So my career field in particular is a very, very low risk of, um, deployments. Normally you may get one or two in your career and they're normally not very risky. Um, you know, you, you might go to cutter, um, but you're in a pretty 
nice setup, honestly, as far as um, deployments go. Um, whereas like my friends who were um, contracting officers, which may not sound like someone who would be getting deployed a lot, they actually get deployed all the time because they're the only people who can spend money on the government's behalf. And so when you're doing, you're trying to set up a base or there's all these things you're trying to do with contractors or you've got to have cash exchanging hands, they have to physically be there. But as a computer engineer, um, you know, in my career, there was no real reason for me to be over there. Um, so I was, I was never deployed. If I would have stayed in, I would have had at least one deployment. It probably wouldn't have been to a rough location and it probably would have been six months. Um, so realistically, you know, the risk factor for me and danger and, you know, uh, ever needing to use a gun or anything like that was extremely low. And that was because of your computer engineering, uh, degree and background. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my career field, um, was called a, you're called a developmental engineer. So basically to be that career field, you have to have an engineering degree. Now it doesn't mean you have to have a specific type like I could have been an aeronautical engineer and they could have put me in a kind of a more computer engineer type role because it's a little generic. Um, but, uh, I was lucky enough to get to be in mostly computer engineering type roles. My first roles were, um, we're still in, you know, it related, but we're more in the, like involved with space, um, which was really interesting. You know, my first job out of college. Um, which is kind of crazy to think about when you think about the responsibility, there is no like getting coffee stage uh, when you go this kind of lifestyle, there, there is no like easing into it. It's like the first day out of college, I'm 24. I've got a team of probably 14 people. I think probably five of which are military. The rest are civilians. They're working at places like Lockheed Martin and you know, you name it, um, really smart people that are all reporting to me and I've got like a $14 million budget. And my job is to make sure that, um, upgrades that we have done to these giant radars are that they've been done well enough to turn it over to the actual field. And these, what these radars do is they track ICBMs, which are intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are nukes. So like <laughs> my job is to make sure that, you know, before, actual operators start to use these things that we have tested and verified that they're ready to go and that we're going to be protected against nuclear attacks. That's my first job ever. You know, that's, that's right out of the gate. Um, there is no interning, there is no like easing into it. And so I think it's an unfortunate thing that, um, especially certain sects of the, the military don't get more credit for the experience that they have because six years of that experience to me is a lot more valuable than six years of experience that someone else might get coming straight out of college into a corporate environment because the stakes are high right out of the gate. The responsibilities are high right out of the gate. You got to make big decisions, um, right out, you know, right from the get go. Yeah. Uh, all right. So question, another kind of military question for you. Could you have chosen to stay in the military for longer I believe it's 20 years to get a pension. Um, okay. So help me, uh, understand your decision between staying for a full 20 years to get that like pension for the rest of your life. Um, which I I've actually had, um, uh, David by, um, uh, by year, um, on, on the show who he got his like 20 year pension. And that's one of the ways he got the FI. Um, uh, but, and I totally butchered his last name. So sorry, David, I love you. Um, but I'm curious, why did you decide to stop out of the air force versus continue on to get that pension? Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Like the 20 years you get that pension. It also comes with, um, life insurance or not, sorry, not life insurance. It comes with health insurance for yourself and your family via TRICARE for the rest of your life. It comes with this thing called space available flying, where you can jump on planes that are, you know, moving cargo from say Hawaii to Germany for free. It comes with a lot of really cool benefits. Um, but realistically the earliest you're going to get that right is 20 years. So I would have basically been 44, um, before I'm going to, before I could get that. 
I ended up actually doing six years in the Air Force. I did my time in Colorado Springs, and then I'm doing my time in Boston. And so the way it works is when it comes time for you to go to your next location, you can either choose to get out or to move. And if you move, it comes with another two years of time commitment. Um, so you can't like move and then get out a week later. At the time, this was 2019. The economy was in a, a great place. The job market was really hot. I was living in Boston. Um, There's a lot of good tech jobs there. You know, me and Leslie had been together at that point for, I think, four years. And, you know, we were pretty serious. And so you start to look at the whole picture. You start to think, okay, how much money could I make on the outside? What age could I retire on the outside? Um, how much more control could I have over my life? And then what does that impact do to her as well, right? So maybe if I get stationed in, you know, um, maybe if I get stationed at like Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is near Dayton, Ohio, that's not great for her career. What does that do to the earning potential for the two of us as a whole, you know? Um, and when you start to look at the math, I think you could retire a lot earlier than 44 on the outside. Yes, the pension is is amazing. Um, but when you start to do the math and how much more you could earn on the outside, and then if you invest that and compound that, um, you know, you could outpace that. And then not only financially now is it a win, but from a personal life perspective, you get to live wherever you want to live um, and have a much smaller subset of rules that you have to kind of live by. Um, so that's, that's kind of the decision, you know, that's kind of the, the things that I use to make this, my decision and the things I would always encourage people to, to use to make their decisions is to really look at what is their market value, depending on their career field. Um, and what are the things that are important to them and what are those kind of second order effects that come from either staying or leaving. Gotcha. So I know that you discovered like many of us, myself included, uh, Mr. Money Mustache and the the blog article, the shockingly simple math behind early retirement. Am I correct in assuming that you discovered that while you were in the Air Force? Yeah, yeah. I discovered that in 2015, I believe it was. And it was a it was an interesting time for me because so I'd graduated college, had my computer engineering degree. I commissioned in the air force, even though I was only making 40 something thousand dollars at the time that felt like a ton of money to me. Like I had more money than I knew what to do with. I had kind of done everything I'd set out to do, but I was living 1100 miles away from anyone that I knew. And I was pretty depressed. I was miserable because I had done everything that I wanted to do and I didn't know what was next. I didn't really have like a purpose. And so I started, you know, really trying to think like, what is it that will make me happy? What is it that makes me happy? And it always just kept coming back to, you know, time with friends and family and, and doing those meaningful things. It's like, well, okay, let's reverse engineer that. How do I get there? Like, how do I be able to spend as much time as possible with them, go on trips with them, that sort of thing? the biggest thing that's in the way is the job. The reason I'm not near them right now is because of this job. So how do I not have a job? And so I start to, you know, look into all these low cost of living places like in Thailand, you know, I'm looking at these places that come with a guest house and a, and a gardener and all these things for like $600 a month. And I'm like, okay, like that's doable. Um, but I don't think I can brute force save my way there. And I don't know anything about investing, you know, and, um, and it just starts me down this rabbit hole. And then I come across that, that article and I start to see the math and I'm like, you know, if there's one thing on this earth, I'm good at it's saving money. I can handle that part. So, <laughs> so then it started to seem very real to me and I can vividly remember, you know, writing things on my little whiteboard, in my office and, and talking to people back in 2015, tell them I was going to retire by 40 and them thinking I was insane. And now I'm like, 40 is a piece of cake. Like that's, that's not even a tough goal, you know? <laughs> so, um, that's, yeah, that's definitely how I ended up getting on this financial independence path is, um, it's just by like being faced with the reality that 
this kind of stuff doesn't make me happy. What really makes me happy, um, just all I need is is time. And to get time, I just need to be able to cut the job out. And to cut the job out, I just need my finances to be in order. Yeah. So did that Mr. Money Mustache article, as well as kind of your um, research into financial independence, help you make the decision to... Uh, you know, step out of the the Air Force and into kind of like the the public sector. Not at like the initial moment. I mean, it just got me going down the the investing and the understanding that part of the equation. And then it wasn't until I started to get into some jobs that gave me some really marketable skills for the outside, um, and starting to realize my you know, my earning potential on the outside that made me make that decision, um, armed with all that information that I had learned because of, you know, discovering that article, understanding how to calculate and think about, you know, the compounding interest and think about, you know, how much earning that much more at this age would impact, um, my future possibilities. Um, you know, my last job in the air force was actually helping, organizations in the air force move their applications like their computer applications from on premises. So physically being hosted on a air force base to into public clouds like Azure and AWS. Um, and then all the tooling to, to do that. And that is a very marketable skill. That is something that plenty of tech companies are looking for. So I was very fortunate, you know, I wasn't doing something that was only military specific. It was, it was a very marketable skill. Um, that people were, um, you know, people were really looking for and willing to pay for. Yeah. Now you said, I believe 2019 is when you left the air force to go into the public sector of work. Is that correct? That's correct. And what was your first job out, out, outside of the, uh, the air force? Yeah. So, um, a company at the time by the name of Pivotal reached, uh, well, I guess anyways, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah. So a company reached out to me who worked in a lot of these same kind of field where they're trying to help customers, you know, deploy their applications, move things to the cloud, that sort of thing. Um, and they were looking for what is called a customer success manager for some of their enterprise accounts. So this is some of their largest accounts. Um, you know, working for companies like Travelers Insurance, FOIA Financial, a lot of a lot of large companies. And basically your role is to make sure that whatever it is that they purchased, um, that they're getting the most out of it, that you're showing that value back to their C-suite. Um, you know, you're also doing some things around escalations if they have problems or if there's feature requests that they have. Um, but essentially after that straight salesperson makes that initial sale, you then t take over ownership of that relationship um, from then on. And you're looking for expansion opportunities. And um, but your biggest role is just showing them the value of what they bought so that they continue to buy it. Because in this, you know, SaaS or software as a service environment, customers always have choice to go somewhere else and they have to choose every year to continue to buy that versus the way things historically were in the IT space where things were sold in a, a perpetual sense. You bought it once and then you're paying for support after that. You know, now whether it be, you know, Netflix or there's clothing subscriptions, we got a subscription for everything these days. And so now it's all about, you know, retention and annual reoccurring revenue is, is the, is the name of the game. Gotcha. And I'm curious, when did you create uh, Saving Sherpa? And like, how did that come about? And then intertwine that with like the formulation of the Financial Independence Show. I'm trying to understand when those came into your entrepreneurial, uh, you know, nine to five W2 Phi journey. Yeah, I started Saving Sherpa first. And my goal at the time was, um, because when I started my journey, I had $38,000 and I had no idea what I was doing. And I thought, you know, there's people out here writing about personal finance, financial independence, but they're all people who've already done it. And to me, it feels very easy to talk about something that happened to work for you. 
what I wanted to do was kind of like have people follow me through the journey. And that's where the name Sherpa came from. Um, also a little analogy into the, uh, you know, the mountains because of stock market going up and down peaks and valleys. So I wanted people to kind of follow along my journey. And if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, you're going to see it real time. And I was going to be extremely transparent. I was going to put up exactly how much money I was making, exactly how much money I was spending, exactly what I was spending it on, um, how my investments were performing, everything completely transparent online. And I want to say that was probably 2000, maybe late 2015. Um, I honestly can't remember off the top of my head, but it definitely came first and it came pretty early. I'll be the first to admit that I haven't put as much effort into that project as I should. And, and I'm several months behind now at this point on uh, getting those things posted up there, but, but I will catch up. I always do. Um, but yeah, so that's how Saving Sherpa came about. It was really just meant to be this place where people could come and watch somebody do this real time. And then along that journey, I discovered uh, Camp Fi. I actually like filled out a like a paper to try to get like a sponsorship to where I didn't have to, <laughs> where I didn't have to pay for the the fees to go and got picked up to go. And it was one in Arkansas. Now I'm living in Boston at the time, which is also where my co-host Cody, my now co-host Cody lives, but I'd never met him before. And this camp five was in Arkansas. So I show up to this one in Arkansas, end up meeting some of my like very best friends in this space at this, you know, random trip, including Cody. And he had started a podcast with someone else, but we hit it off. And then his co-host decided mm, it's not something they really want to do. They'd only gotten a few episodes in. He asks me if I'd be interested. And I said, you know, like, I'll give it a shot. Like, I don't know if it's something I really want to do. And now we've had it for over four years um, and have over 250 episodes. And I think we're closing in on 2 million unique downloads. So. Um, it's, it's been fun and I've definitely, I've been a lot more consistent with it. And I think that comes down to having a co-host to kind of keep you accountable. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, give people a sense of what Camp Fi is. I'm familiar with it. Cause you know, that's, uh, I, I took my wife there to kind of, uh, show her that there were other people that were interested in this thing called financial independence, um, which was probably the best move I ever did for my relationship and money. Um, because I think, uh, similar to a lot of people, you know, I discovered financial independence through Mr. Money Mustache and I was like, all right, we're not spending money on anything. <laughs> what the fuck? Like you're trying to like kill all of our fun. Um, so that was like one of my strategies is like, Hey, I will pay for your ticket to camp Fi if you'll just go with me. Um, and it ultimately, uh, empowered her to meet other people that were doing Fi in different ways and, uh, to meet people that were, you know, women and, um, you know, more creative and, and just kind of, uh, approaching Fi in a way that worked for them that she could get behind. Whereas my way was like hardcore frugality and extremism. Um, so that was a good move, but what exactly is camp Fi? Um, so for the listeners, if they're interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of camp Fi. Um, they have them all over the U S um, you can imagine, I think generally it's kind of like 30 to 50 people at one of them. And the thing that separates it from some other financial events that might go on, like you may hear people talk about FinCon or, or whatever, is a lot of those events are more around kind of the content creation and um, like spreading the word in that way or building a business around it. And Camp Fi is really just a, a much more intimate, um, closer knit thing where you come together for a couple of days and everybody just shares their journey and they will have little side sessions where maybe Somebody wants to know like, Hey, how do I deal with health insurance after financial independence? And that could be a place where you could go to that little pod and learn about that. Um, and then you're going to have a couple presentations throughout, um, where people are presenting on all kinds of topics. Like I've presented on, you know, my background and just my story. Um, and then you're also gonna have plenty of time though, where you're, you know, just out like in some canoes or shooting arrows or, you know, whatever it is, camp type stuff. But it's, um, it's really just a great place to go and kind of 
find like-minded people to share those stories and, you know, find inspiration. Uh, some of it is actually like tactically finding information on, you know, how to take your next step. Um, but some of it's just, I think, to get re-energized because it's, uh, for a lot of people, it's a, a fairly long journey. Um, even if it sounds short to maybe other people who are thinking like, oh my goodness, you're going to retire at, you know, 30, whatever, you know, six, seven years of doing something is still a long time and you can still kind of lose steam. And, um, it, it, I think that's a big part of it is it helps rejuvenate that piece. Um, and it's cool because you've got people who are really early on their journey who don't have much figured out and you got people who are already there and done and you've got the full spectrum. And, uh, so it's, re it's really fun to get to share, um, you know, expertise with people and then get to learn from people at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Basically, it's like camp for a bunch of people who are interested in becoming financially independent or like want to get more into like creating money and wealth and independence and freedom through money. And there's people from all walks of life like, um, you know, you'll you'll see people that are in real estate, people that have W2 jobs, people who are just starting out their kind of money journey and they're like at net worth zero, or maybe they're in debt and they're like trying to figure out how to get to net worth zero. And then you have people that are in the middle of their financial independence journey or people that are really close and they're like suffering from the like one more year, I'm going to work one more <laughs> year and then I'm going to like retire. Um, so highly recommend, I'll leave some, uh, links in, uh, in there. So David, uh, Boyer, the person I mentioned, uh, before, um, who, uh, got the financial independence, uh, with a military pension, along with real estate investing and stock investing, his brother, his twin brother, Stephen Boyer actually puts on camp Fi, and they're both like awesome dudes. And I'd hi highly recommend if, if you're just wanting to connect with more people in real life that are into kind of financial independence and building wealth, it's a really fun, like low key thing to do. Like Justin mentioned, you know, like you're shooting arrows or you're, you're going hiking or kayaking and it's always in a, like a fun kind of nature place. Um, and like, you know, there's people playing spike ball and other random, you know, card games and stuff. And it's just, it's just like, camp for ad adult money nerds and um like summer camp and <laughs> it, it's like i loved it it was literally one of the things that really i think put me on the trajectory um that i'm on and it helped me really understand how to do my financial independence journey in a way that was really um empowering and fun for me because there's a million ways to kind of do the journey and you just got to figure out like what's the best way for you so we'll leave some uh links in the show notes for people who are interested in camp Fi to check out but uh let's let's get back to justin's story so you have that first job in 2019 in customer success and then i'm curious like was there any strategies that you used, you know, after getting out of the military or the Air Force to continue to save as much money as possible and earn as much money as possible? Yeah, I mean, you know, when people are always looking for a blueprint on the the saving money part and there's, you know, there's overarching things you can do that you can tell people, but kind of like that that Hilton story with all the points, right? it's more about learning that mentality and learning like what to look out for and learning how to look at things than it is do a, B and C because everybody's life's different. The things people are interested in are different. The opportunities that come your way are different. Um, but definitely always, you know, saving money was, was a big priority of mine. I mean, you know, I, at some points was saving upwards of 90% of my income, um, as my income continued to grow. Um, for instance, like another opportunity that came our way that, you know, it's not necessarily repeatable, but it's also not necessarily something that anyone there that everyone would have done is, you know, when COVID hit, Boston really shut down and I had just so happened to have bought a little van in February before I'd even heard the word COVID. Uh, I had always wanted to do a little camper conversion and this was a very small van, but I did this whole conversion myself. Um, to give you a sense of kind of how that frugality goes, I converted this van 100% minus like the electrical stuff for $250. 
Uh, I was getting on Facebook, uh, buy nothing pages, you know, somebody's redone their flooring and they've got some extra, you know, uh, flooring left over. What are they going to do with 30 square feet of flooring? You know, they're just ready to give it away. Somebody puts out a dresser on the, on the, uh, curb. Boom. There we go. You know, all this stuff, like you take a, a, take a mattress, cut it up into its parts, grab some fabric. Somebody's getting rid of, you know, I've built a convertible bed, like all these things. Um, I ended up being about 1200 bucks in it all in, um, with all the electrical and everything. But anyways, like we, you know, it worked out perfect that, okay, now I've got this like thing that we can use as an escape as Boston is just shut down. And so we decided we're gonna go this big road trip. And as part of it, we're gonna, you know, we go across Chicago, we go across like New York, Chicago, Colorado, and we're gonna go down to Texas and surprise Leslie's parents. And when we're on our way down there, they have no idea we're coming, but they mentioned that they have their little condo downtown. The renters are moving out. Now, at this point, me and Leslie have been together for, you know, five years. I'd never even seen this little condo. Um, but we go down there, we surprise them, and we go check it out. It's 375 square feet, so it's tiny, but it is like right downtown, uh, right on the water in Austin. It looks pretty rough. And it uh, had not been being managed very well um, by, by Leslie's dad. And so they weren't getting market rates for it. And again, it was pretty rough. Well, we decide, you know what? Like, let's talk to our bosses. Let's talk to them about going fully remote, regardless of what happens with COVID. And this is like early, early COVID. So this is before it's kind of like now everyone seems seemingly works remote. Um, and you, you know, and obviously COVID ended up lasting a lot longer than people thought, but we, we just worked that out with them back in what would have been probably June of 2020. And then we worked out a deal with their parents and said, Hey, if you'll let us live in the apartment at what it cost you, which was almost nothing like $275 a month for a year and give us a small budget, we will redo this apartment for you. And we will get someone in here and rent it at a much higher rate than what you're renting at today. So long term, it'll be a win for you. It'll be a win for us. So we get to rent this apartment for $275 a month. Now, keep in mind, it's 375 square feet and we both work from home. So what did I do on my move down to Austin? I found a 1960s phone booth on eBay because I wanted one of those like cool work pods. that kind of looked like a phone booth. There's a little that you'll see in a lot of open floor concept places, but they're like four grand. I was like, ah, I'm not doing that. So I find a, a 1960s steel phone booth for $400 and, you know, I weld up some of the broken corners, sand it down, paint it, mount a screen in it. Boom. I've got me a work pod and we live in there for a year. And at that point, I'm making pretty good money. Leslie's making pretty good money. And we're spending $275 a month on rent. Like I was, I literally spent probably $20,000 that year. Um, and again, that's just one of those things. No, not everybody has a family member who has a condo downtown that whatever, but also not everyone would have saw that and thought, Hey, this is how we can make it work for both of us. This is how, this is something I'm willing to sacrifice. You know, this is, this is how it's going to set us up. This is going to allow us to easily buy a home, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, just really thinking through the implications and thinking of ways which you can find some mutually beneficial opportunities is huge. Um, so that was definitely a big way from a, from a saving perspective um, that I could think of. I can get into the earning part as well, but I don't know if you want to talk about that piece a little bit. Yeah, I do want to talk about the earning, but I, I just kind of want to draw this out for the audience. So, you know, what Justin is doing is, and you did it from a very young age, you developed this like this money mindset where you were always looking for strategies to essentially get the most bang for your buck with like outside of the box thinking, right? So, you know, the, uh, the Hilton points is like a perfect example of like, you're like, wait a minute, like, there's a way that instead of just saying yes, like you can pay for 
uh, you know, the hotel, it was like, wait a minute, you can pay for it, but I want you to pay me directly so that I can use my, uh, my card. And you didn't even tell them this. You were just like, just pay me directly and I'll do it. So on the back end, so you were legally not doing anything, uh, unlawful. It was completely legal. What you're doing, you just, um, and took advantage is the wrong word, but you utilized the systems that were already in place in a strategic manner that would empower your money journey at a faster rate than if like you had just done the default. Um, and I think you can, uh, throughout your entire life, you've repeatedly done that, you know, you were interested in getting college paid for, not really interested in the ROTC, but you're like, wait a minute, let me just see if I can figure this out um, or find something here. You went and investigated it, realized like, wait a minute, I can actually get paid to go to college, right? And the, the mindset there was like, how do I make money from this opportunity, right? Um, and that's what you continually, uh, continuously have done. Um, and it's actually two sides to it. You're, you're looking at how do I make money from this opportunity? And the other side that you often look at is like, how do I save a ridiculous amount of money in this circumstance, like the phone booth and the condo and all that. So you're kind of looking at both sides and you're always just looking for that strategic advantage. And maybe it only gives you like a one or to 5% improvement in terms of like either money making or money saving, but you stack one after another, after another, after another. And then suddenly all those like, you know, aggregation and marginal gains are like, are ultimately result in like a massive, uh, transformation or change to your financial or money trajectory. If I got that right. So, and I think that's a strategy that, anyone can adopt if they choose to use the mental brain power anytime an opportunity comes up to either make money or spend money uh they just start to like okay how can i actually turn this um situation into either a money making opportunity or money saving opportunity versus just being lazy and just like okay cool i'm just going to do what everyone does yeah and you know a lot of people they'll they'll hear things like this and or they'll see the way i think about things and you know, they're oftentimes saying, does that not just like stress you out? Like always thinking about how do you get the most out of something? And it doesn't at all. Like it's the opposite. It's so fun for me. Like it's addicting for me. Like I love to look for these kind of things and I can kind of tie it back somewhat to growing up when we didn't have much money. I felt like my mom did a really good job of making it almost like a game, you know, like, okay, we've got this much money. Like what's the most we can do with it? Like, you know, like be creative think about what you can do with it, with this small amount of resources. So no matter how much money you have, it's still finite. And so there's always, to me, room for creativity just because like, yeah, you've got enough money to do that. Would you rather do that? Or would you rather do these other three things? Even if you have enough money to do that, that, that first thing, would you still not rather do these other three things? Um, and while we were only spending $275 a month on the apartment, like that didn't mean we weren't traveling. Like we were traveling like crazy. I've got this Google doc from, you know, one of the years where I actually tried to keep up with all the, the trips we went on. And it's honestly too much. Like it's exhausting how much we would travel. <laughs> so like people will fixate on the things that I'm doing to save money and think, Oh, what a restricted life you're living. Oh, how, you know, annoying this must be how boring, like, why don't you want to live? And it's like, you show me someone who goes on more vacations than me. Like show me somebody who travels as much as I do that isn't fully retired, especially. And I would even argue that there's not too many people who are fully retired who travel as much as I do. I'm not living a restricted life whatsoever. I'm just very efficient with my money and I, and I only spend it on the things that move the needle for me. Yeah. In my own financial independence journey, I basically did the same thing is I, uh, or similar thing, maybe not as long, uh, as you. So I basically went through a period of two to three years where I was hyper frugal. Um, but for me, I made it a massive game. Like it was always a game. Like how can I figure out how to like, uh, you know, make more money 
or save more money. And it was just like, it was a never ending game. And I had so much fun for those entire two to three years um, that I was, you know, being hyper frugal and that, you know, I've shared my story on the podcast um, before, but that's how I went from basically, you know, uh, you know, being deeply in debt to like a millionaire in two years is because I was hyper frugal, but I wasn't just like playing the frugality gamification game. I was also playing the like earning and making money in multiple different ways, um, you know, at my W2, but also in many other ways. And it was just like a never ending game of like, uh, and, and for me, the game was based on like, how high can I get my savings rate? And that was like the score of the game was like the higher I can get my savings rate. And similar to you, I, I had times where my savings rate was like 90% plus, um, you know, for multiple months in a row. And for some people, like they thought I was crazy because like I did this in my mid thirties, right? You were doing this in your mid twenties. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, people would be like, what are you doing? But then they would be like, you seem like you're having so much fun doing this. And the <laughs> truth was, or, or the truth was I was, I was having a, a ton of fun. And I think that's, you know, one of the things I want to point out for the uh, audience is really anything you do in life, like with the right mindset, you can make it fun and cool. It's just a choice to, to like live from that perspective or you can be like everyone else or most other people and, uh, you know, kind of just save less than 5% of your money and not retire or, you know, have enough money to retire until you're, you know, 65 or whatever the retirement age is. So I really love that you are a shining example that, um, a, not only is this possible, uh, you know, despite like, uh, childhood where money was really tough. Um, but also that it can be an incredible amount of fun, uh, filled with travel and, you know, experiences and memories that are, you know, really going to provide a rich life for you. Um, you know, as you look back at the end of your life. So I'm curious, you're now 2019 to you're about four years into your public career. Um, at 2019, what was your net worth? And then how long till you got to a millionaire? Because I know you said uh, you're a millionaire by 30, or excuse me, uh, you're financially independent by 30 and a millionaire by 31. So help me kind of understand where you're at 2019 and then how you got to financial independence, what that number was, and then um, when did the millionaire status follow? Yeah, it was, it was a pretty wild climb. Like I left the Air Force in September of 2019. Um, so that was about a little less than six years after I joined. Um, I was 29, like basically 29 and a half right there. Um, I had $360,000 was my net worth at the time. And then I hit a million dollars. Uh, let's see. I hit a million dollars, um, almost exactly two years later. So October of October of 21, I crossed, crossed a million dollars. And that's the other thing about, I think that's, you know, again, I talked about how I, not only is, do I think my story is repeatable, but I honestly think it's, it should be so much easier for a lot of people, right? Cause those six years, not only did I start a little later than a lot of people, cause the five years in college, the seven months sitting on the sidelines, you know, so I'm almost two years behind my peers at that point. And then those first six years are a government job. Like the pay is not terrible, but there's plenty of people who are going to, who out earn me for those first six years, no doubt. So not only do most people have a two year advantage on me, most people will earn more money that not, not when I shouldn't say most people, but a lot of people will out earn me for those first six years. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very doable. Um, you know, now what happens in 2019? Well, that, th that snowball that I had been building that hadn't been growing super fast, it'd been growing a little bit. Um, I got in, you know, I started making more money. I started spending out actually less money that in 2020 because of that condo. Um, and then the economy took off and the, the stock market took off. 
you never know when it's going to come and that's why it's the long game but like all of a sudden you get like a 30 percent year um and it makes a huge difference so that's how i went from you know 360,000 to a million in basically exactly two years was nothing fancy it was just you know i did get out got my w-2 job where i was making more money um but i did not have extra streams of income i had not started any kind of business you know the podcast wasn't really making any money the blog certainly cost me money every year to own um so it's not that sort of thing i didn't have some ridiculous side hustle there was no inheritance it was just pure savings and stock market return yep literally the same thing as me so that's uh when i hit the peak of my earning and the peak of my saving was during that 2019 to the 20 uh 21 mark when the stock market was going nuts and i was like every month i was just like invest like socking everything into the stock market um and it's like i love that you pointed out that it's it's not about like essentially trying to time the market it's just about like putting yourself in the position to take advantage of when the market like takes off like that. Um, like, you know, the last couple of years, the market's been pretty flat. Um, and even sometimes like coming down and dipping, you know, when COVID first came, like it dipped like almost 40 or 50%. And like a lot of people just stopped investing, even though that would have been the best time to like invest even mm -hmm. more aggressively. Um, so I think that's why kind of like the saving and investing habit, like just like consistently saving and investing, no matter what's going on, that's how you take advantage of these like, you know, stock market tidal waves that will come, but you never know when they're really going to come. Um, but you can, you can take advantage of them if you just consistently save and invest every month, no matter what's going on. Yeah. I remember when I first got hired on at the, at the, you know, private sector job out of the air force, I'd, I'd never had access to, you know, what's called the mega backdoor Roth. Um, I didn't have access to that functionality or, or those type of accounts while you're in the air force. That's not something you can do. Um, but as soon as I joined that company, I started researching, like, is this something I can do here? Is this something I can do here? And within a month, I'm giving presentations to the company about how to do this. And most of the people who have been working there for years had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and you know, I had, I joined in September. So I basically had, you know, say three months to stuff this thing, to try to max out the, you know, to max that account out, which was, you know, an extra 30 something thousand dollars. But I just, I had completely turned my paycheck off for probably five months where I was getting $0 all of it was just funneling into this thing so that I could fill up that bucket before that calendar year was out. Yeah. Break that down for the audience. Cause I haven't spoken about the mega back uh, door um, strategy yet. Can you break that down for the audience? So they actually understand what the heck you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to quickly pull up the, uh, um, you know, the because these numbers change every year, right? So I was going to quickly pull up what the 2023 numbers were. Um, so I think it's 66,000 is now the, sorry, let me, I think that's the number. 60, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people have probably heard of a, a backdoor Roth, um, which is just a, it's still a powerful tool, but nowhere near as powerful as this, where once you start earning too much income, you can no longer um, use a, you can no longer contribute to a Roth IRA um, and you're not getting any tax benefits from a traditional IRA. But what you can do is put money into a traditional IRA and then convert it to a Roth IRA immediately. And now you're getting the benefits of those of the Roth IRA, regardless how much money you make. So that's, that's, that's all fine and well, but that's that basically that $6,500 that you're talking about. And that is the backdoor. Then Roth. there's the, that's just a straight up, you know, it, you won't see the word mega before it. That's just a backdoor Roth. And that's using an IRA where the mega backdoor comes in. Now it's involving your 401k and not every company has the rules in place to allow this, but it's definitely worth looking into, which is to say, you know, most people, they think about like that, you know, 20, what is it? Look, that's the only number I don't see. Sorry. Uh, is it? 
it's oh yeah so so when most people think about their 401k they're thinking about what now in 2023 is the twenty two thousand five hundred dollar limit and that's all they think about they think that's the limit that's the limit that you can put in to either a roth or a traditional bucket that is the limit of which like a company uses to match off of that sort of thing but technically the limit in all those accounts is $66,000, including the match. So let's say you put in the 225. Let's say to try to make the math a little simpler, your company matches a certain percent that equals $7,500. So now you've got $30,000 in your 401k between the Roth and traditional buckets. Well, there's actually a third bucket that most people don't know about. It's called after tax. That sounds like Roth, but it's actually different. The way it works is money goes in after taxes, but then the money that's in there is also, the earnings are also taxed. And you might be thinking, well, that just sounds like a brokerage account. Like, what's the point in that? Well, what you can do is you can put money in there and then immediately have that rolled over into your Roth 401k. And now that money can grow tax free. So if you put in 225 and your company matched 7,500, that's 30,000, that's an additional $36,000 that you could push in that can grow tax free every year. It's like having a, an additional six Roth IRAs all of a sudden. And if your company doesn't match anything, that means you could put, you know, 43,500 in there that is can grow tax free. So now you're talking, you've got like seven <laughs> additional IRAs that you now have access to basically, um, as far as the, the power that you've just unlocked. So that's a, that's a lot of money that you can put in every year that can grow tax free. And because it's Roth dollars, right? You can always touch that principle. So it's not like you're locking up the money for the rest of your life. Yeah. How do people figure out if their company supports the mega backdoor Roth uh, strategy? I think probably the two best ways is a, you know, trying to get in contact with someone from like an HR finance kind of role in your company. And then B, whoever is like the steward, you know, like for us, we use Fidelity, um, contacting someone at Fidelity who, you know, handles the, the workplace um, plans. So that way they can answer the specific questions about, you know, the rules around your plan. So like, for instance, for us, um, I can set it up to be automatic where it just, it just happens. I don't do anything. There's no risk of that money, um, of that money, like gaining value. And then me having some kind of tax implications because it's automatic, but the trade-off is that it has to go into my Roth 401k, which I cannot touch until I'm no longer an employee. You, but I can manually call and have it rolled into a Roth IRA. And then that way I have access to it whenever I want. I chose to do the automatic part because I didn't foresee any reason why I would need to touch the money while I was still an employee. So little nuances like that could be different between companies. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. And, and again, just to repeat for the audience, this is all completely legal. It's just one of those money game strategies that you can take advantage of if you're willing to put in a little bit of extra effort um, but you can make it a game and have fun doing it that can result in you socking away. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people don't realize, like, if you don't get taxed on your stock market gains, like you are saving potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime, like maybe even like upwards of a million, depending on like how long you work for and how long you contribute uh, to a mega backdoor Roth strategy. And it's like, it's like, this isn't the only thing Justin has done to really like power himself uh, to, you know, millionaire status and financial independence. But it's like one of many strategies, but this is like a big one that if you just, you know, take 30 minutes out of your day, contact your HR, contact your, you know, 401k provider, have a couple conversations, see if it's possible. And then suddenly you are set up to take advantage of this, uh, for the rest of the time you're at this particular company. And then anytime you go to another company, 
invest another 15 to 30 minutes contacting HR, 401k uh, provider, seeing if it's an option and then getting it set up. And then like, it's just repeating that process every time you move uh, jobs. So thank you for illustrating that, Justin. Like I definitely haven't talked about it on the show. I don't even think I've talked about the regular backdoor Roth, um, which if people are curious how to do a regular backdoor Roth, if you're not able to do the mega uh, backdoor Roth, I'll actually put a link um, to a blog article or two that explains how to take advantage of that. Um, basically, and I don't know the numbers, but if you earn too much money, you can't contribute to uh, a Roth, but there's a backdoor strategy to easily do it through a company like Videl uh, or a brokerage firm like Fidelity or Vanguard or Schwab. Um, and I'll leave some, some blog link articles in there, but more importantly, if you can take advantage of the mega backdoor Roth, it's infinitely more powerful than the backdoor Roth. So, uh, go ahead, brother. Oh yeah. And I was going to say, just if you're looking for kind of the two main questions to ask when you're asking to figure out if this is possible, your company, see if they allow after tax contributions. That's kind of the key words. You're looking for that third bucket and then ask if they allow in service distributions. And that's just meaning while you are still working for the company that you're allowed to move the money from that after tax bucket into that Roth bucket um, so that it can actually go tax free. Those are the two check marks. If you can do those two things, then you can do the mega backdoor. Awesome. Cool. So let's do a bit of a left turn. Um, there's three things I want to cover or technically four. So I'm going to prep you with, uh, one of them. So I'm going to ask you for a tip tool or strategy that you would give, uh, to the audience as a leave behind one for fitness, one for money and one for life. So let that sit and simmer in your brain. And then let's quickly talk about how you went from being like super overweight to like pretty fucking shredded now. Like, because like, <laughs> I seriously thought you're one of those people who was always like just super freaking lean. Um, and then when I was doing research and you mentioned that you were overweight and I'm like, what, when was this guy overweight? So, uh, <laughs> one friendly note, uh, when we do talk about the fitness, like I am plant-based and I like my show to be fairly plant-based friendly. So like, just keep it plant-based friendly in your kind of like, uh, and, and you know, you don't have to be too shy, but I'm just like putting that out there. So how, yeah, you, yeah. how'd you do it? How'd you lose yeah, all the I weight? Mean, I <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been a couple different phases and one of them was definitely how I mentioned earlier, like I kind of take setbacks or rejections or whatever and use that as fuel. And my whole life I had been pretty heavy set. I mean, when I was a little kid, my nickname was literally fluffy cheeks. I was like a little <laughs> kid. Like that's what my nickname was. Uh, I would not get in a pool without a shirt on. Uh, you know, most, I feel like 10, 12 year old boys, well, you can't hardly keep clothes on them. They're just running around, whatever, like all my nephews and stuff, but I would not change clothes in front of even just another subset of like 10, 12 year old boys. Cause I was so like ashamed of kind of how I felt like I looked. Um, and then, you know, going through RTC and stuff got me into to better shape. But then as I was an upperclassman and stopped having to do as much of that sort of stuff, you know, I exited college at a really bad 230 something pounds. Like, you know, you could be 230 pounds and, and be something you want to look like. I was not that. Um, then I had a situation where, you know, I was interested in a girl and she ends up not being super interested at the end of it. And I get just kind of pissed off and motivated again. And I get really deep into, you know, kind of the, the calorie counting and the macro counting, which I had never done before. And it fit really well for me from, uh, you know, I love to, you know, I've, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that has everything I've spent money on since my journey started in 2015. I can tell you every dime I've spent. So that kind of mentality, it worked really well for me, this kind of tracking and it really simplified things for me. And I think that it's something you know, there's optimizations, obviously, with the types of food and, and the way you eat and all that sort of stuff. But I think at its simplest form, so many people, the vast majority of people who are not trying to go from like in really good shape to top tier 1% shape, like the, the mass majority could do so well by just spending a couple months of tracking their, you know, calories and macros, like setting some goals and trying to hit those. Because now I know what 
calories and macros look like. Like I now know what, you know, a serving of chicken or a serving of, you know, uh, broccoli actually looks like. I now know what like that olive oil is doing as far as how many more calories that's adding when I use this much versus that much. And I just never trained myself to do that. Um, so that got me to, you know, more of this kind of like 185 range where I was in, you know, in decent shape, but I wasn't super lean. Um, and that's where I was for, for a long time. And then this past September, uh, there was this new gym coming to town. It's a chain, it's called F45 and it's like circuit training. Um, and Leslie wanted us to try it. I wasn't real sure about it. I ended up falling in love with it. Um, really got addicted to going to classes and we also both decided to quit drinking and which has been a, a huge, huge change for us. And it's been honestly the best thing that I've ever done in life. I wish I would have done it years before, not just nutrition, not just financial. Those are actually way behind in the, in the reasons. Um, but we decided to stop drinking. It definitely has helped <laughs> on the nutrition standpoint, but so now I'm doing these circuit training classes, which involve a good bit of weights and uh, I really dial the nutrition in. And so that's how now, now I'm kind of running it around, you know, like 157 to 160 most of the time. And, you know, for those listening, I'm, I'm like a little, like six foot, almost six one fairly, you know, I have fairly like long wingspan, that sort of thing. So I'm a pretty long lean guy, but, uh, it has not always been that way. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm curious how long. So I'm, I'm sober as well. I stopped drinking in, uh, it's been like eight plus years. I think at this point, mm. literally one of the best life decisions I've ever made. Like it translates to your fitness, to your money, to your mood, to your lifestyle, to everything. Um, like, so it's like, uh, and again, that's what like most people drink. It's like yeah. part of like, uh, American society and many other societies. And, um, it's definitely played a part in like, I just feel like, you know, being sober, you're, you're so much more motivated and driven and you put your energy towards more productive things that can be equally as fun, if not more fun. And the best part is you remember everything and you never wake <laughs> up with a hangover ever. Um, so yeah, absolutely love that. I'm curious how long have you been uh, tracking your food at this point in your life? Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, like I spent a little time tracking it during that first phase. And then I'd say probably, I know what it was. It went, at the gym, they started this kind of eight week challenge thing back in, I want to say it was like mid, late October of, of last year. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'm going to do that. And and then that allowed me to, to go when we went to Cabo in like really good shape. And I love, you know, I love the way I looked and I just had a lot of confidence from that. And so I just decided to kind of stick with it because realistically what would happen is like, I don't know, I'm not the type that wants to be that regimented every single day, every single week. So like, but I would do that for a period of time. Like I'd have something circled on the calendar that I wanted to kind of be ready for, that I wanted to feel good for. And, and then, you know, I would maybe have a little bit of time where I'm, I'm, you know, having a little bit more fun with my food, not worrying so much about it. And then I'd have my next thing circled and it's like, okay, let's, let's get back in there. And so most weeks, um, I'm calculating all my stuff since October. So what is that? Um, maybe nine months. Yeah. I'm at, uh, not to, and, um, the, the drinking thing okay. was about, um, and drinking has been about 13 months. Nice. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with you. Like tracking macros and calories is a tool that you can keep in your like fitness toolkit that like whenever you want to, you know, get, uh, in great shape for a trip or a wedding or whatever, um, you don't have to do it year round. Um, but, uh, it's definitely one of those things that you can use, um, and, you know, tracking is the way that I've stayed, I've stayed, uh, basically sub 10% body fat for about the last eight to nine years. Cause I have been tracking my food for the last eight to nine years. Um, and that's just for me, that is like one of those fun games for me that I play now. Mm -hmm. That's not the game for everybody. Like some people like 
that is like uh, too extreme, right? But I, I know like there's a part of me that loves being extreme. And for me, it is a game. Like one of the games is like, how, like, can I be sub 10% body fat year round? Cause similar to you, like, you know, I was like super ashamed of my body growing up. Like, you know, didn't want to change in front of anyone, take off my shirt, like never wanted to go swimming or anything where I was, you know, had to go shirtless. Um, now I was never like crazy overweight. I was just kind of like, you know, kind of fit, but kind of fat, like, you know, enough fat to kind of cover the abs and the muscles. So no one would say I was overweight, but no one would say I, I was like shredded. Um, mm -hmm. and I was always kind of like ashamed of my body up until, um, my early thirties when I first started tracking, uh, and finally got in great shape. Um, all right, let's circle back to those leave behinds, uh, tip tool strategy, one for fitness. You can take the easy route on that one. If you want one for money and one for life. Yeah. So this actually transitions real well into this fitness one. And I remember saying it on one of our podcasts and it just kind of came to me, but it was, you know, if you weigh your food, you don't even really have to weigh your body because it, it really is such a simple thing. You know, there's things in life that are, um, you know, they're not easy, but they're not complicated kind of things. Like, um, it, it takes, it does take discipline to do it, but it is so straightforward. Like your body works in a very scientific way that is well known. And if your calories out are more than your calories in, you are going to lose weight. You know, it's just going to happen. I've come up with every excuse on earth, why other people were always in shape and I wasn't. And at the end of the day, <laughs> it is all in your nutrition. So if you weigh your food, you don't even have to weigh your body. Love that. How about money? For money. Um, this is kind of a fun one that I like to use. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they're always asking me, well, like, what should I spend money on? What should I do? And again, there is no cookie cutter answer, right? So um, what I always say is, what did you have to eat last Tuesday? And they always look at me really weird. Like, that's a super weird question. And I'm like, well, what'd you have? And they're like, well, I don't know. I was like, exactly. If you can't remember something after a week, then that's probably not something to really like put high on your priority list to spend money on. But now if I ask you, like, what's the best concert you ever went to? Your eyes light up. You remember all these details. Like, you, you really pour over it. Those are the things you spend money on. Those are the things you prioritize. So it's just a little kind of conversation starter. You know, what did you have to eat last Tuesday? So if you can't remember it after a week, it, it's probably grounds for cutting from your budget. I could tell you because I'll just bring up my fitness pal and be like, <laughs> okay, here's what I ate. <laughs> but again, I'm, I'm a bit of an anomaly and I know that. And I get the point that you're making is, is essentially like spend your money on the things that are going to create like happiness dividends that will pay, like pay out in happiness dividends for the rest of your life. Like, you know, big things like concerts, trips, like celebrating like an anniversary in a, a really special way. Um, you know, so I totally get what you're saying. How about, uh, that's definitely kind of like a life tip tool strategy as well, but do you have an additional one for life? Yeah, for me life. And again, this is a, a, another kind of overarching one is like, do what's best for you, not what's like expected of you. And so, you know, we talked about like everyone, almost everyone we know, like drinks, almost everyone, you know, maybe owns a home or has children or, lives in the same place for most of their life or has this kind of job, whatever it is, like, don't worry about that. Like, I think everything should be a conversation. Like no matter how radical of an idea that you have for a lifestyle, if you want to build a commune with your best friends, like think about it, consider it. Like maybe that does make sense for you. Like if you want to live in an RV, think about it. Like maybe that is what's best for you. Um, but don't just feel like you have to kind of fall in and do what the, everybody in society does and be okay with being an outlier. I love that. Last two questions for you. If people want to check out the financial independence show, uh, do you have a episode recommendation that you could, uh, leave with us that I can put in the show notes? Yeah, I would recommend people check out episode 188, which uh, I think you can just go to the fi show.com slash flow 
and we kind of break down exactly what to do with your money at every point in your money journey to just make it really simple regardless of where you're at on that money journey. Awesome. Uh, any last words of wisdom, anything else you want to say or request to the audience that you want to make as well as where's the best place to connect with you online if people are interested in connecting with you? Yeah, I would just say, you know, I know I said it a few times, but I think that the path I took is is very repeatable and I fully expect uh, a lot of people to outdo me and it's it's out there for the taking. I mean, if a kid can come from a poor gra- background in Mississippi with no real footsteps to follow in and then work a government job and, you know, retire in their 30s without any kind of special life events happening, you know, why can't you? So definitely know that it's possible. Um, and then also to not look at someone who is at that point, like where I am at today, and then just look at them for what they are. Think about the journey they've been on, get to know them. Uh, you know, everybody, there's people who are in a place where maybe it looks easy today, but kind of respect their journey. Um, and then as far as the best place to find me, you can just Google the words saving Sherpa and it'll pop up whether that's Twitter, the, um, the blog, uh, you know, Instagram, whatever it might be. If you just Google saving Sherpa, I'll pop up. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Yeah. Thank you for having me.